Yes, brother, do you have something? Well, I just want to say we enjoyed the church a lot this morning. I'm blessed you for being here and coming back tonight. It's uh, good to meet people that are doing the right thing for God. Mm -hmm. And it, I will tell you, it's encouraging to have folks come back after Sunday morning to come back Sunday night. Amen. 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 I, I, I like Sunday night. And uh, some would say, well, it's a little more relaxed. It, it's not. It's a little more in-depth. Amen. Uh, I've always looked at it as there's, we have three different services, technically four if you count Sunday school. But we have four different times or four different services, and each feels different. Amen. Amen. I enjoy breakfast, but I don't want it for three meals a day, seven days a week. Amen. Amen. Hey, I, and I can cook a good breakfast. Amen. John enjoys McDaddy's. You say, what's a McDaddy? Well, some people go to McDonald's and have a McGriddle, and he eats at home and has a McDaddy. Amen. And, uh, boy, it's filling, isn't it? Amen. And a big boy grilled cheese. Amen. That's tonight. Amen. Every Sunday night, it's a big boy grilled cheese. You'll have to get the soup on that later. Amen. The second Samuel, chapter number 23, if you would, take your Bibles, turn to, to verse number 13 is where we're going to pick up. We've been looking at David's mighty man, and to be honest with you, I want to be one of God's mighty men. I have a burden to be what God wants me to be. And may I tell you, it, it, it's not always easy. You say, preacher, you mean it's not always easy to be a mighty man? Sometimes it's discouraging. Sometimes if we look out and we would even count back at all of them that we've looked at, it's 800 to 1. Amen? Amen. But all we have to do is lift the spear. And, and God will encourage us. And God will bring the great victory. And may I tell you, as we've looked at these and, and continue to look at these mighty men, it wasn't the men. It was God. Amen. And so as we think about their devoted attitude and their devoted service to their king, we can have that same attitude. We can have that same desire to our king. And so we look at 2 Samuel chapter number 23. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll pick up in verse number 13 as we look at the three all for a drink of water. Amen? Notice this if you would. In verse number 13, and three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time under the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hole, and the garrison, garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. Verse 15, And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the, thir and the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Look at verse number 17. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this, is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? And therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. Now, I, I really, uh, we'll pick up on, we'll, we'll end here in verse number 18, but really we're going to end at verse 17. We'll pick up on verse 18 next week, but I do want to read it to you so we can see who some of these are. We find uh, Bishai, Ai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, uh, was chief among the three. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them and had the name among three. And we know in verse number 19 that he was more honorable, but I don't want to preach on him tonight. I want us to look at the three together and I want to look, look at their journey and what they were doing. I want us to... to be able to place ourselves in those three. I wonder if we'd be one of the 30 that would go out and seek this water. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank You that we have Your Word that we can study and that, Lord, that we can, can just see Your desire for our life. And, Lord, as we get encouraged as these three went out, Lord, they broke through those Philistines. Lord, they went to the water. 
They went to that well. They drooled that well. And they, they came back with the water. And Lord, that water that would quench. That water that would satisfy. Lord, I pray. You would help us. Lord, that we would desire to, to break through. Lord, that we would desire to be filled. Lord, that we would desire to be used. Lord, that it would all be to your glory. Father, I pray. Your will to be done tonight. Speak to our hearts. Lord, that you'd receive all the glory in our lives. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. We come to this passage of Scripture and we think about these three that go out. In fact, the Bible tells us that they're three of the thirties. Now, realize that they are not the chief. Uh, they are not the 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 Adino, they are not uh, Eleazar, they are not Shamla. Amen? Uh, we know that they were the three of the three. They were the three mighties. They were the three of the very, very top. Amen? And But yet there's three more that come on the scene. And boy, I've done, you know God always works in threes. That's just kind of free. That's not in the notes tonight. But God always works in threes, does He not? Amen? I think about that three. Oh, the three and the one. Amen? I think about how the three work together. And may I tell you that God created us in His image. Amen? And we were created in His image. We have three parts. Now, I realize until you're born again, that spiritual part is dead. Amen? But we think about those three that had went out from here. In fact, they were the three that had stepped up. Uh, maybe there was 30 around that had heard David say, Boy, I sure like a drink from that well. That well that I'm familiar with. That well from that place. That You know, there in Bethlehem. But yet there was three of them that stood up. Now how far would we go for a, a glass of water? Now I've shared with you before, uh, my grandma and grandpa's place had the best water that you could ever have. I don't, I, I don't care where you go. And it's not the same well water as here. You see, it was hard ground. And you had to bore through that rock to get there. And when you did, it was good water. It was cold water. It was, I don't care how hot it was on those, those days. I remember as a young child, back before my heart was right, I'd go barefoot, amen? I don't go barefoot anymore. And uh, I would go out there, and that, that sidewalk going around and around Grandpa's well was so hot, and you'd be carrying those, those buckets. And even as a young boy, I'd do everything I could to get as much water in it as I could. And I'd bring it back to Grandma just thinking I did her this great big favor. And little, I guarantee she had to go back after a couple of things. They didn't have any water. It was a ladle. And after a couple of ladlefuls of water, she had to go back and fill it up because I couldn't get it very full. But I did it with all of my heart and all of my mind. And I remember grabbing a hold of that big old pump handle and it'd be hot. And boy, you'd begin to pump that water. And it'd finally start coming out. Oh, it was refreshing. You say, preacher, was it always clean? Well, sometimes there'd be some chunks that I don't know. Water was always clean. It was always very clean. Probably parts out of the pump, to be honest with you. Now, as an adult, just kind of looking back, Amen. It was an old pump. It was, it was tall. Even, even today, I guarantee you that's a five-foot pump. I mean, it was, it was massive. And as a young boy grabbing a hold of that handle, that was the best water you could ever have. Mom and Dad would bring it from their house and, and uh, from Grandma and Grandpa's back home. They'd carry a couple of gallons at a time so that if you wanted some drinking water, it was always good drinking water. You see, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is we don't go that far for water today, do we? I mean, honestly, you might have your little water that you purify, but does it satisfy? How many have ever had bottled water that you're They've added some stuff to it. Amen? And it's not quite what it's supposed to be. You say, Preacher, sure, what's this have to do with anything? There was one well that he wanted to get to. There was one place he wanted to go. One, only one would satisfy. Only one would do. Now, and think about this. How willing are you to get to that well? Knowing that the enemy's before you. Knowing that you're going to put your life in danger to get there. Now, how willing are you to get the water for someone else. <laughs> Amen? Listen, what's our desires today? How, how far will we go? What are we willing to sacrifice? You know, 
I think about this, and I, I think about this water, if we just think about the pictures of the water in the Word of God today, we, we, we know that there's a couple of different types or a couple of different pictures that's from the water. I think about, uh, well, the water of the Word. Amen? We could look at Ephesians chapter 5, and the Bible tells us that it's, it's from the washing to the water of the Word. We think about John chapter number 15, and Jesus tells us that we're clean because He's washed us by His Word. And so we think about that water of the Word. We think as well in uh, Psalm 119, verse number 9, where it calls how the young man cleans his ways by taking heed there, or there, according to that Word. Now, we think about that water in the Word, but we think as well about the Holy Spirit. Take the Bible, turn over the book of John, chapter 7. John, chapter number 7. And we we look at this in the in the attitude. Now, hold your place in, in 2 Samuel, but turn over the book of John, John, chapter number 7. And look at verse number 37. In John, chapter number 7, verse number 37. Now, I guarantee you, every one of us have had a point in time that you've become waterlogged. I remember in football as a, as a young young boy that it was hot and we used to have two days, amen, and you'd get up in the morning and you'd have football practice and then in the evening you'd have football practice. And by the time you got to the evening football practice, you was already wore out before you ever suited up, amen. And it was hot and it was miserable and I remember that when they would release us to go drink water, we drank water. I'm telling you, I mean, it was like a trough. We just... As much water as we could possibly drink, we were drinking it. And then you know what happens? It's not a pretty sight. And boy, you get out there you, because you couldn't walk. There was no walking. And no, you don't walk. And so what we had to do was run back. And as soon as you started to run, you could feel it going full, 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 full. It wasn't good. And yet, you say, well, it was hot, didn't it satisfy? It was what your body needed. Why why was it so much? Listen to me. I know people today that don't want anything of the Lord of the Lord because they feel like when they get it, they walk away going slosh slosh, slosh slosh, slosh slosh. And then it comes out. Amen? And you say, well what does that have to do with getting to the well? If you get to the right well It'll satisfy you without the slosh. <laughs> Amen. It'll be the right way. You say, well, how is it in us? Notice this in John chapter number 7, verse number 37. Jesus speaks to us about this well. He says in, in the last day, or in the last day, in the great day of the, of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, may I tell you that the... the King longed for a drink. But do we long for the drink from the king? Amen. Amen. You see, we all need to come to the well for salvation. Amen. Amen. He said, if you come unto me, you'll never thirst again. John chapter number 4. We think about John chapter number 6. If any man thirst or if any man hunger, then he is the bread of life. Amen. And we can come unto Him. And there is no Spirit until we've came unto Him. But, once we come unto Him, do we desire a filling? I'm not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's normal. That's as soon as you're saved. But may I tell you, there's a difference in the filling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. When we think about these that are going out and these mighty men that God's using... And may I tell you that we can be mighty men used of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it all comes from us getting to the well. And so I simply titled this, Getting to the Water. Notice if you would, we find the king's longing. The king's longing. Now in order to notice why the longing is there, we find here in our text, in 2 Samuel chapter number 23, the Bible tells us in verse number 15, 
And David longed. Now, understand this. Well, why was there a longing? May I tell you that absence brings a longing. It does. I remember when Sarah and I was, would be separated, not, not because we were separated, but through the military, we, we spent time separated. I shared with you before that Jonathan was 18 months old when I joined the military. He was three years old by the time I got back to where we could even pretend to be a family. And you say, well, what do you mean pretend? Well, because June 17, 1998, I signed into the unit here. I want to say it was less than a month later I was already gone for a month. So Jonathan was three years old. In fact, I believe that you guys had his birthday the day before I got back. Or, or two, because then we were turning and driving straight here. And so, there was times that we didn't get to spend time together. And may I tell you, when I would be deployed, or I would, would not be with her, I long for my wife. Amen? That should be normal. Amen. Uh, amen. It should be normal. You know, even we could bring it into today. I can't wait to get home from work. Because I long to be with my family. Amen. Amen. I've, I've just enjoyed my family. I've enjoyed my wife. It's the wife that God gave me. And she's mine. And I enjoy... Listen, I'm talking about longing. When we're not together, I long for her. When I'm together with her, I shouldn't have to long for her. She's with me. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and I realize that this may seem common and may seem simple and... and we would begin to just have that, that idea of, well, why would I be longing for it? May I tell you that there's times in our life where we're not nearly as filled with the Spirit as we're supposed to be, and yet when the problem comes is when we're not longing for it. Amen. Amen. I know many today that aren't longing for any more Spirit. They're not longing to be closer to the Lord. They're not longing to have a better walk, a closer walk. I told you before about Brother John Hanna's testimony. Every night before he goes to bed, he prays, Lord, help me to be closer to you than I, tomorrow than I was today. That's what we should all desire. And I think about this longing that the king had. Well, notice, first of all, it was because of the sight of the well. It was because of the sight of the well. He wasn't with that. He couldn't just walk up to that well and get a drink. Amen? And so there was a longing. A longing in his heart. I wonder if we would look at this well for just a moment, we would realize that it's past the enemy. The Bible tells us here that the Philistines were their garrison, or their headquarters if you would, was there in Bethlehem. We find that as well that they had pitched their tent, or had been pitched in the valley of Rephaim. Now, in this valley, it means giants. Hold on a second. You mean I've got to get past the enemy? That their headquarters are going to be located where this well is. And I'm going to have to go through the valley of giants to get there. Do you understand that there's some things that we're going to have to break through? In fact, if we would look at the text, it tells us that these three broke through. They broke through. I've known people that have never broke through. They've never came to the place that they've been able to go past the enemy. I've shared with you before that sometimes we are our own worship. Amen? Amen. Many of the storms that we have in our life are self-induced. I'm just stating the fact. They are self-induced. Amen? And we come to the place in our life that we've got to get past us if you want more spirit. Amen? If you want to get to the well and get a drink that's going to satisfy, you're going to have to get past you. That's the very first enemy that you've got to face. Amen? Because that means that you've got to get up. Oh, first of all, you've got to recognize that you need it. Is that not where we normally are? David longed for it. David recognized he needed a drink. Amen? He recognized that, hey, the enemies are there. They're keeping me from this. But may I tell you, often we don't recognize that, that we need anything. We're like, well, I'm a little parched, but I'll be all right. Sarah's mom used to tell the children that when they were hungry and driving in the vehicle, she'd tell them to uh, chew their fingernails and swallow their spit. They'll be okay. 
Some of you think that that's mean, but that's what we are as Christians. We're like, oh, I'm okay where I am. I, I'm really not that bad. Amen? I'm really, you know, I, I know more scripture than some. I, I got a closer walk than others. Amen? And so we're looking at getting here, and the king's got a longing for this well, and, and yet we find the side of the well is not where it should be. At least in convenience wise. It will never be convenient to come to the Lord. You say, preacher, I, I mean, he, he comes past, he comes to us, he does, but you've got to get past him. Take your Bible, turn over to the book of John. Now, I know I had you there earlier, but look at John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4, look at verse number 9. The next enemy we have to get past is the world. We have to get past the world before we can ever come to the world. Amen. The world's got a hold on you. You'll never come. I, I realize we use the term carnal Christians, but they really doesn't go inside. Carnal means worldly or fleshly. And Christian means Christ-like. The two don't mix. It's like oil and water. It does not mix. And so when we consider uh, this idea of worldly Christians, they they can't be. They, they can't exist. Uh, we were in the Bible Institute this afternoon and Brother Richard was taking his test and I, I was reading in Psalm chapter number 12 as, as he was taking his test and, and uh, just... Just a thought here as, as uh, God had kind of directed my eyes was in verse number one. It says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. You think about that one verse, the godly man ceaseth. Tomorrow as we go out and we get ready to go to work, how many godly men do you know? Not many. Not many. I guarantee you, when I go to work tomorrow, I won't find one. I'm serious. Now, I'd like to think that I'm a godly man. I'd like to think that I have a, a godly presence about me. There will be no other than tomorrow. You say, what about Brother Mike? He works with you. Well, Brother Mike's on vacation. So guess how many I'm going to find? Amen. And, and that should mean something to us. Because it begins to wear on us. Amen. The battle will wear you down. Notice if you would, John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4, look at verse number 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You say, preacher, what does that have to do with getting to the well? The well is available to all. Amen. Amen. The well is available to all. If we'll get past us, if we'll get past hold on to the world, we can come to the well. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking about the lost. I'm talking about the saved. I'm talking about the ones that are the mighty men of God. When we come to the place that we need that strength, we can have it. We need that power. Now, Lord willing, next week I'm preaching a message that I've simply titled, Where Will You Be When the Spirit Shows Up? You know what we're lacking in our churches today? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm serious. And we'll see that a little bit tonight. It's not, this didn't spur the sermon for next week. I already had it written down a month or so ago. But yet we find that we need this power. And the side of the well seems so far off. But we can break through. Notice as well there's a satisfaction of the water on point B, sub point B. There's a satisfaction of the water. You're right here in the book of John. I want you to stay there for a moment. And David longed for this drink because it was the only water that would quench his thirst. It was the only water that would satisfy him. May I tell you that I'm afraid that others are out there and they're trying to try other waters or they're trying to satisfy themselves in other ways than the Lord and you'll never have it. You'll never have strength any other way than through the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so uh, we, we always like to quote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 
But if we're not coming to the well to get the strength through the Holy Spirit, may I tell you that you are not truly strengthened through Christ. You're doing it on your own. Amen. I've had some times in my in my pastorate that I have just been completely exhausted physically, mentally, spiritually, all. And we come to the place and, and it's time for me to preach and I, I don't have the strength to do it. You know, the Lord's taking over. I'm serious. I love those, those times because I don't have to worry about me having the strength. He does. It's the only water that's going to satisfy. The only way that we're truly going to have this, this desire within us when we find as well, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit again. Notice if you would in chapter number 4 again of John. Look in verse number 13 and 14. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, don't mistake this. I'm not saying that uh, you've got to get re-saved. Amen? But I am telling you we get discouraged. Now, I am telling you that we need to go back and, and enjoy that well. Be satisfied in the things of God again. Amen? Amen? Be strengthened by the Holy Spirit again. Uh, get back in His Word. Get back in prayer. Amen? Amen. And so this satisfaction that goes on, boy, I'm telling you, God is longing for us to take a drink of this water. He's longing for us to have His Spirit within us. I think about uh, God's desire... As, as we look at those coming for salvation in 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but His long suffering does work, that He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. We think about Revelation chapter number 22 and verse number 17. The very last invitation given in the Word of God is at the very last of the Bible. And he says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life free. You see, what about us as a child of God? You say, preacher, I've already taken that. I, I'm, I'm saved. I've drank that well. And, and boy, I, I don't have I have that indwelling of the Spirit, and I don't thirst again. Remember Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18? Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. How much filling do we really have? Think about Pentecost there in Acts chapter number 2. What were they waiting on? It wasn't the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I know in John chapter number 7 we had already saw that Jesus uh, was talking about the filling of the, or the uh, Holy Spirit as the fact that they didn't have it yet. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They had not uh, received it because they had not uh, Jesus had not been glorified yet. But may I tell you that Jesus had all, he had breathed on the disciples before Pentecost and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. In fact, if you would, turn over to John chapter number 20, look at verse number 22. This is free, it's not in my sermon. It's not in my notes, just something I want to share with you. He says in chap, chapter number 20, look at verse 21. John. John chapter 20, verse number 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. When did they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? They received the Holy Ghost right there. You say, but what were they waiting for in Pentecost? They were waiting for power. They were waiting for the filling. He said that you shall receive power. Amen. What we're lacking today is power. They broke through because it was all about the water that satisfied. Amen. God desires for us to be spiritually fit. Notice as well we find on point number two, the servant sacrifice. Not just the king's longing, but we find the servant sacrifice in this text. We find that they were willing to sacrifice or it was a sacrifice for their master. Well, why did they go for the drink of water? It wasn't for them. It was for him. 
It was so that they could, could reach that. There was, a never, there was never a question of loyalty. Never once was their loyalty questioned to David. May I tell you that our, question, our loyalty should never be questioned to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Uh, there, you can be loyal to the church and listen, I believe that there's only one Northside Baptist Church. I love Northside Baptist Church. I think it's a great church. I think that God meets with us. Amen? I believe that God's using us. I believe that God works through us. And you should be faithful to the house of God, but not for the church. Amen. Amen. Not even for the pastor. Amen. Hey, I enjoy your loyalty. I'm thankful for your faithfulness. I'm thankful for your love for me and my family. But if you're here for me, you're here for the wrong reason. Amen. 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 I wonder how loyal we really are. I think about David here. As, as the Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter number 11, verse number 15, it gives us the same account. You could also look in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, it will tell us the same battle. But we find in 1 Chronicles chapter number 11, and verse number 15, it says, Now three of the thirty captains went down to the rock to, the rock, to David, into the cave of Bedulam, and the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. Now, I bring us to a couple of definitions here because they came to the Master even when there was danger at hand. They came to their king because they were loyal to him no matter what others were doing. There was a war going on and they went to him during that war. <clears throat> you see, it tells us that they went to the rock. Now, if you would look up this in the concordance, you would find that this means we all know what a rock is. We're talking about a foundation in figurative manner. But we find as well, figuratively, it means a refuge or an edge. Properly, it would have been a cliff or a boulder or a rock. Now, a dulum means justice of the people. It was a high mountain. It was about 13 miles to the west of Bethlehem. This is where they went. And David just said... I'm thirsty for water 13 miles away. Now, I already told you they had to go through the Valley of Giants to get to the headquarters of the Philistines to get to the well. 13 miles they traveled. Good thing it wasn't most Baptists today. You'd say you're superstitious and you're not going 13. You'll go 14. I'll go 12, but I'm not going 13. <laughs> Amen. But truthfully, how loyal are we? You know it's not hard to sacrifice for the master when our master is settled. I think about 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 12. For the, the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Do you realize that? They're settled. The apostle Paul said, I, I, I know. Hey, listen. I suffer these things. I'm going through these problems, but I know who I have believed in. I know who it is that I've committed my soul to. I know who it is that's walking with me. I know who it is that I'm going for. Amen? When they went for the water, they knew who they were going for. Amen? Amen. There was no question in their mind why they went. And so we find as well that they sacrificed for the mission. It was a sacrifice for the mission itself. They were willing to die for a drink of water. The enemy was just as real if they were drawing a sword against the enemy or if they were going to get the water on the other side of the enemy. Amen? The danger was the same. May I tell you that Satan knows exactly what you're doing when you desire to get closer to the Lord. Do you not recognize every time that you set out going, I'm going to get close to the Lord, that there's an enemy against us? Amen? When your mission is to get closer, to be more like Him, Satan says, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that. I'm going to be the enemy against you. 13 miles worth. Amen? Hey, I know that you went to that rock, that refuge. I know you went to that rock, that firm foundation. I know you went to that rock, the edge. Amen? Amen. But I'm going to be against you the whole time. 
the mission that we have is real. Amen. Is there anyone here that's more like Christ? To where Christ has said you don't need to be any more like me? No. I've told you before, you will never have to worry when you get to heaven that God's going to say you was too holy. It's not going to happen. Amen. Amen. And so as I think about this mission that we're going to have, and this mission of, of getting to this well, we have not arrived. And there's a hazard. Amen. And I think about Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20 tells us I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, yet, uh, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. Why do we live? Why do we go on this mission? Well, my, my master's sudden. But as well, my mission's sudden. I want to be more like him. I want my life that I live to be his. Amen? Amen. We think that we have an unpopular message today. Take the Bible, turn over the book of Jude. <clears throat> How many would say that over the last 10 years, things have really gotten wicked? Oh, I, I'm telling you, things that are accepted today, I don't, as, as I was a child, I don't believe that it would have been allowed. I, I really believe that they would have been ran out of the towns if they tried to do this. In. Even some of the big liberal towns. Amen? But it hasn't gotten more wicked, or has the wickedness just been more accepted? Amen. Because to be honest, they knew that they wouldn't be accepted and they wasn't as open about it. I'm not just talking about homosexuality. I'm talking about any of it. Well, I know. I remember the first person that I ever saw with a nose pierced. I really did. I was already I was already out of school, Sarah, and I was already married. There was a guy that came to work there at the cabinet shop where I was a supervisor and he wasn't in my department. He was odd. And one of the very first things you saw was his nose ring and you said, man, this guy is a freak. Amen? It was, oh, you did Today, the more metal that they can get on them, the better. I'm expressing myself. No, you're not. <laughs> you're a maniac with me there. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. Listen, we have a mission today because it's accepted. And, and Brother Richard, don't tell me that my sin matters. It might offend me if you tell me that my sin's bad. It's not a popular message to preach against sin, is it? It's not a popular message for your co-workers to hear that their lifestyles are wrong. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm telling you, we need to preach the truth with love, but we, the problem is, is we need to preach the truth. Amen. 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 Notice Jude, verse number 3. In Jude, verse number 3, we find our unpopular message here, but unpopular then too. <clears throat> Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. you realize where we are today? There are more and more churches that preach false gospels. There are more and more churches that preach social gospels. There are more and more people that... I'm talking about those that used to preach the truth. This year we had started off our year in revival with the idea of walk on. I'm watching churches that used to preach the King James Bible that are going to preach the King James Bible. I'm watching churches that used to only believe that contemporary music sounded like the world that only used contemporary music. I'm learning churches. They don't even worry about souls. And yet Jude said, 
I wanted to just talk to you about salvation. Salvation shouldn't be any sweeter to the one than to the ones that are already saved. Amen. Amen. We well, hey, I love to talk about the cross. I love to talk about my salvation. If someone gets offended when you ask them when they got saved. Hey, I'm, I'm serious. Amen. It's like you asking me when I was born. Hey, I'm not even afraid to hear. Amen. Now my boys tell me my, I'm old. Jacob, I don't know what you're laughing about. Son, I know where you live. But <laughs> the truth is, for a little while, <laughs> you'll get that later. <laughs> but, but truthfully, when someone gets upset because you ask them if they're saved, or if they're going to heaven or hell and they get upset. And Jude said, well, I just want to talk to you about the Lord. Didn't even identify himself as the half brother of Jesus. He just said, I want to talk to you about my Savior. Amen. Yeah. But I need to talk to you about continuing with faith. There's a mission that we have for us. Amen. We need to contend with faith. You know what's happening today? There's people that said it's not that important anymore. Sacrificing for the mission doesn't mean sacrificing the message of the mission. Amen. Otherwise, we've set the mission down. Notice as well, we find the last point is the Lord's glory. I've listened to a lot of old preachers. I'm telling you, I love to listen to some of the old time preachers. But there's one thing that just seems to ring out with some of those old time preachers is about the trophy that they're going to get in glory. I'm talking about their crown. I know spiritually it's considered a crown. Biblically it's called a crown. I, I get it. But they're trophy Amen. If you're here today as a trophy builder, you go out witnessing so that you can have greater rewards in heaven. You are wrong. Amen. Amen. I want you to look at this in this passage of Scripture that we're looking at tonight. We find in verse number 16, down at the very end, it says that they brought it to David, and nevertheless he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Oh, I'm telling you, if we would get to the place that we were just poured out unto the Lord, let Him be glorified for us, through us, in us. Oh, how great, how great God would be seen. I think about this on A, we find that He was glorified for the water. I told you earlier in the introduction that there's two types that I wanted to draw out tonight. I think about the water of the Word. Oh, I'm thankful for the Word of God. I'm thankful I don't have to worry about what is the Word of God. That's settled. Amen. I think about uh, Psalm chapter number 12, verses 6 and 7. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as, as silver tried in the furnace of earth. Keep them, O Lord. Preserve them. This generation forever. God's Word. Jesus said that not one jot, not one shall pass away. Not even the smallest amount of punctuation is going to move. Amen. You know why? It's established. It's done. Oh, I'm thankful for the water of the Word. I'm thankful that it's still sharp. Amen. We look, looked at that last word two weeks ago at how sharp the Word is. Amen. Amen. But notice as well we find the Spirit. Boy, I'm telling you, why is the Spirit of God always bringing glory to the Father? Because it points to Everyone to the Son. Do you realize that the Word of God, the crowning of the Word of God is Jesus Christ. The entire theme of the Bible is Jesus Christ. It always points to the Son that brings glory to the Father. Jesus said, my, my work here is to bring glory to the Father. Amen? Why does the Word of God bring glory to the Father? It points to the Son. It's not about the Spirit of God. It's about the Son of God. It's about the Spirit of God working in us to point others to the Son of God. Amen? It's never the fact that the Spirit has lifted itself up. It's the fact that it always points to the Son. 
that always brings glory to the Father. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's not because, boy, look at me. I'm filled with the Spirit. Look at me and all that I do. It's the fact that it always points to the Son. Amen. Amen. David said, boy, these are the ones that had put their life in jeopardy for me. These are the ones that went to that well. These are the ones that were willing to sacrifice. Oh, Lord, let you get the glory for it. Amen. What happens today is we build these churches and they become glory to the pastor. They become glory to the people. And we forget all about glory to the Lord. Amen. Amen. We find also that God's glorified through their walk. We think about the fact that they walked in what the world would call jeopardy. May I tell you, walking in the will of the Lord, you'll never be in a safe place. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible, turn over the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 5. I want us to look at a few things here real quick. We'll finish it up. Galatians chapter number 5. Look at verse number 16 is where we'll start off. Galatians 5 and verse number 16. David the king could have easily said, look at how good I am. Look at how much they love me. And I'm telling you today, we need to come to that place. Say, look how good our God is. Look how good our King is. Amen. It's not about me. I think about John the Baptist's testimony. John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He must decrease. Notice in Galatians chapter number 5, we find in verse number 16 through 18. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, love, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now we can read on down and we find the fruit of the, spirit, the, fruit of the, the flesh, if you would. Amen? I know many today that are reaping from what they are or what they've done. Amen. Amen. We find as well, and in, in starting in verse number 22, we find the fruit of this, the Spirit. But notice on over in verse number 25. Actually, we pick up in verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. How many have done that successfully? If you don't do it tomorrow morning when you wake up, they'll take over. And Tuesday morning when you wake up, they'll take over. You might even have to have a midday service where you crucify the flesh. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you that the flesh will rear up on you before you know it. And God gets no glory through it. Notice if you would as well, verse number 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, Provoking one another, envying one another. I wonder, do we live for others to see our King in His glory? Think about it. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 16. But let our lights so shine before men that they may see your good works. And hold on. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. The problem that we have is we're okay with Him seeing us. Well, we need to point everything to the Lord. David did wonder if we're willing to break through that we could be where God wants us to be. Lord, I need to get to where I am closer to you. I guarantee you there's no one in this room, now hold on a second, you can be more spiritual than me. But there's no one in this room that's as spiritual as where God wants you to be. Amen. No Amen. One. Also with that, there's no one that's not able to get to well. Amen. Amen. And I wonder if God's getting all the glory for us. Or maybe we're not giving him anything to glorify over. It's a time to come to the well tonight. Just show him. He's my master. I want to know more about him. I want to be more like him. I need to crucify this old flesh some more. I'm not asking him to do anything but be honest with God. You don't need to be honest with me. I'd like it if you are. Amen. Brother Richard, don't be a liar. Amen. Amen. But truthfully, I'm not asking you to do business with anyone in the Lord. I'm talking about three men that said, you know what, I'm going to break through. I'm going to serve my king. I'm willing to sacrifice for him. 
It's going to cost me. Could cost me my life. But I'm doing it for the king. I wonder if he's really king in our life. We'd say, no matter what, it's for you. Please. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Lord, I thank you for that well. It might be past the end of it. Lord, there, there might be a valley of giants I've got to go through to get there. Lord, I even failed to mention the fact that you'll be with me. And I know you will. As much as I desire to be filled with your spirit, you desire to fill me with your spirit. And Lord, help us tonight that we be honest with you. Lord, that Father, it wouldn't be so that people would recognize us. But so that you would be the glory and they would see you. Father, take this time of invitation. Have your will and way. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Every head bowed and right. Music softly plays.